I'm very happy to present Edmund Miller, who's going to talk about uh, genomic analysis in Julia. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, <laughs> but there's no uh, no one in between. Um, so, I apologize if you if you heard the other talk. There may be a little bit of overlap in these, but I thought they were both important, and I wanted them to be fully encapsulated. Versus, like, you needed to watch part one and then see part two. So. Uh, let's talk about unlocking the power of genomic analysis in Julia. So uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I'm also an NF Core maintainer uh, as well. Uh, if you haven't checked out NF Core, do so. Uh, the reproducible bioinformatics pipelines for secondary analysis. This talk is going to focus more on tertiary analysis, which is kind of the downstream of the secondary, which would be kind of more the data cleaning, aligning of reads, et cetera. Uh, for anyone not familiar with that. So uh, first, I kind of wanted to frame this whole concept of like, why should biologists working in genomics be interested in Julia? Um, and I thought that the Why We Create Julia blog post was a great reason for that um, and really sells the point to a lot of these biologists because they've all kind of worked in these various languages at some point probably of like, you know, they've used R and it's just as easy for statistics. Uh, MATLAB, Python, Perl was um, during the... Yeah, <laughs> you know. So they've all used these C shell. Maybe if you have used C, for example, or like in some of the more finer tools, you know, that are that are trying to have some more speed. So just a ton of different languages going on here is really kind of what the issue is. Um, and then there's also a issue with reproducibility. I feel in genomics. Um, and that's kind of my shtick. Um, but I feel that Julia really tackles a lot of those issues with reproducibility in data analysis um, in a lot of elegant ways. Um, so why should the Julius enthusiasts that wandered into this talk care about genomics? Um, so there's an interest in genomics in keeping the cost low through more efficient computation as well versus we don't care about if the results are coming, in, in some cases, we do care about how quickly the results are coming back, but we don't care about if the results are coming back as fast as possible if we're going to save tenfold on the computation, for example, uh, which is an interesting problem as compared to like financial data um, or like stock trading. So right now the cost of a whole genome uh, sequencing is 100 to $1,000 depending on who you ask. Um, the cost of the computational analysis, on the other hand, is about $25. So as you can see, when we're talking about $1,000, eh, $25 is nothing. When we're talking about $100, okay, that's a fourth of the price. Um, and then this is just a nice graph that the uh, NIH likes to put out about how the cost of the human genome sequencing and how it's like beyond Moore's law as well. And so down there, that's 2022, where we're hitting uh, like below 1000 there. And it's kind of a race to the bottom as Illumina lost their recent um, patent on um, the sequencing technology. So there's been a bunch of startups that popped up. So a uh, quick overview of this. So we're going to talk about kind of the Julia features for analysis that I think are important and how they're helping with reproducibility on those. We'll talk about the ecosystem of Julia um, and kind of compare it to like R and Python and all the various packages that you may want. And then we'll talk about Julia and workflows for a little bit as well. And then a little example analysis at the end. So. These features for analysis. Um, first and foremost, I really love Julia up um, and the concept of that. I think that a lot of languages get this wrong in the way that they install this and then helping also to the user to then stay up to date with these various release channels as well of whether you want to use stable or LTS or, you know, your collaborators using some weird package because that's what's on their HPC. Um, Julia up just kind of fixes that. I think it follows the model of Rust up and I think that those are great. Um, and again, just such a quick way for people to get started. Of course, there's also a Windows install as well as if you're interested in that. Um, but that should work on Mac or Linux. And then let's talk about pkg.jl um, and how that kind of affects the various package management in bioinformatics. So as you can see, this is the example from the tutorial of we're just installing an example package. You can pull up the REPL, add this example. Similarly to how in R, you just kind of ad hocly install things at times. Um, from the REPL with library and uh, bioconductor, which is what a lot of people like to do. But the problem is, is that that never gets written down. And then you never know what packages, where they came from, what examples they are. Whereas in Julia, when you're installing this interactively, like a lot of computational biologists like to do, it just writes it down for you as you're working. And then you have that package kept. 
which I think is really key. And it's probably taken for granted a lot in the community here. Um, so then you can also activate these environments, which are also important um, and to in the maintenance of that. And then you can just add these packages, same thing, except the difference is, is that now it's also installed into the project.toml and written down um, comparatively. And then the interesting point down there at the bottom left-hand corner is the um, up caret, saying that that could be upgraded, but it's being held back by various things as well um, on those. And then, of course, you can also hack on projects locally um, with just the develop dash dash local. Um, so if you have something that's broken, you can quickly work on it versus, you know, other languages where it may be difficult to go and find that, work on it, where do you get the PR submitted, et cetera. Um, there's a couple other niceties as well. There's PKG templates um, for easy package creation if you want to write something as well. There's the Julia REPL mastery workshop of we could go on about how the REPL's great and you should be doing REPL-driven development um, and talk about closure and all that. And then there's also VS Code with, with the batteries already included environment um, as compared to some other environments on those. And you can use that in an interactive way similar to you know, what people might be familiar with with RStudio, for example. Um, and then we can talk about data toolkit for a moment as well. Um, this is a big issue that I find in a lot of computational biology is where did the data go and where did it come from? Um, so this is a recent analysis that I did on some TCGA uh, head and neck squame cell RNA-seq data. Um, this is just publicly available data um, on Xenohub that you can pull down. Um, there's a couple of interesting points going on here. You can see the checksum, for example, so that ensures that you have the exact same data type. And I think that that's really powerful because sometimes, you know, the data could have changed underneath or somebody could have reran it, put it, pushed over on S3, et cetera. Um, and then this is just loading the, the various packages as well. Um, some interesting points is just being able to reproduce that argument in a quick and succinct way. Um, versus like somebody forgetting to do git commit and then pushing a bunch of stuff over it and you can't, and then you have to go back and kind of unearth what they changed along the way and why they changed it. Um, so I just think that that's really powerful. And this is all in like a data um format and you can just continue including new and new, more and more data sets that you want in there. So again, just kind of going over some of the various things, lots of different storage loaders and backends, support for S3, web, uh, local files, um, all kinds of stuff. You have metadata as well of like what is this data set um, that this person is pulling in um, in a quick and succinct way that's like repeatable and easy for them to think of. There's also checksums um, and then you can also have the storage loader arguments as well and just have those quick and easy to reproduce. Um, and so just where I think that this is also powerful is then you can start swapping around your types for the various things that you're loading as well, um, like phenotypes. Here we can load as a matrix um, and say we want the dimensions to be one on that and take the mean of it. Or we can also load as an array and do dimensions of one as well and just swap those around. So if you're interested in that, check it out on Friday. Uh, he'll get really in depth on, on all the other things. You can load images, all kinds of stuff. Um, I think it's pretty big for reproducible analysis in that sense as compared to like ML data sets that's a little bit um, more static data sets, whereas this is, you can also check in your results as well, um, which I think are important. So let's talk about the ecosystem. Um, so I threw together some of these tables and I'm gonna put these on the new docs and we'll talk about those in a moment, but just kind of some quick comparisons of like various packages that um, are of interest to people. So I kind of broke this up into general utilities first. So this is just your, your standard plotting and some of the popular ones. And of course you have polars and pandas and data frames. Um, but then we start to get more interesting in the biological file formats. I didn't finish fleshing out the R ones uh, just yet. Um, on those for phylogeny, um, and you could use G ranges, I guess, for GFF. Um, so you have SAM tools, um, reading in various uh, BAM for files as well, VASCU files, variants, um, building phylogenies, biostructures as well um, for proteins down there. And as you can see, BioPython really has a lot of the um, real estate in the Python ecosystem on that. They might even have a VCF package. I might have missed that. Um, and then going into like some of the genomic analyses of that, of like you got 
your genomic ranges um, over there. You can run BLAST as well locally if you really wanted to. Um, you have your DNA, RNA, and, and manipulating those sequences. Um, and so again, just kind of an overview, a good reference for some people. I kind of always wanted to compare and see how many packages was Julia missing, and it doesn't seem like they're missing many that I could think of, but I'll be interested to see if others can contribute to that and find where there are pieces missing. So what about when you can't replace a popular package? Um, so the analogy that my PI made when I was talking about this um, and presenting these slides was he said, like, working in R and Python is like buying a house in, D in, in the center of DFW. Um, and so DFW is like the epitome of urban sprawl. Um, as well. So like if you buy it in downtown, you're constantly having redevelopment, you know, PIP, Poetry, Hatch, PIP Tools, Conda, the tooling's changing, you know, versions are getting updated underneath you. And then like compared to the suburbs where things are nice and planned out and there's a package for each thing and people are working together, et cetera. Um, but you need a car is the real kicker. So um, this urban sprawl of that, of like, you know, you have DC, Edgar, Surat, ScanPy, ggplot if you have like a custom plotting format as well that you really want. So what do you do? We have various Julia interop packages as well, um, like R call, Python call, um, and then you can also just call the command line tools from Julia and it's really easy and baked in and I think better than the alternatives in other languages. So R call is pretty simple. Um, you can just install these packages. Uh, this is just a simple ggplot2. Example, the nice thing as well is it gives you an R REPL, so you can continue the REPL-driven development. And then I just wanted to give a Python call example as well that I used earlier. Um, I cut off some of it for the sake of the slides, but so this is the Python example, and then I thought this was pretty cool when you just swap it in, you actually just lose a couple lines of code because you don't have to do the swap to TensorFlow, et cetera, in the loading of that from those, you can just use the, the Julia array type. And so it's pretty much the same. So you can take these old analyses. You can also call an entire Python file as well, which I thought was cool. Um, so old analyses that people already have that you just wanna use, you can just call that whole file and take the output. And then just to kind of touch on this as well, for anyone watching, uh, Python call and PyCall are two different packages. I think the issue is that PyCall doesn't reference this um, as well, and that's mainly because Python call doesn't have to support as much legacy stuff as PyCall does. Um, also uses Conda package, and then you can also use them both at the same time, so there's no real trade-off. Um, so we can also talk a little bit about managing Conda environments in Julia. Conda, I think, is pretty good for managing these things for most cases because you have Python and R packaged up in those, um, at least for scientific analysis on that. And so this is all you have to do with the conda package to do, to add a, to just manipulate those conda environments. And that's all right, but I thought that conda package um, had a little bit nicer interface for anyone that, that wasn't familiar with it. Um, and so basically you can just add these, add your channels and kind of use the conda environment in a more native way of that sense. And then the real powerful part is the conda package.toml as well. And that just allows you to instantly reproduce that entire environment from that and check it in. So um, what about like command line tools as well and various binaries? And there's a new effort as well to package up some of these binaries. Um, so you can just do pkg install on those. So basically you can just call your commands um, based on those just using backticks. Um, pretty simple, and then you can just run that command with that. That's it. Like compared to you know Python, where there's like six different ways to run it. I feel like, um, and I've linked to the docs down there as well. And then so you can also then manipulate with multiple files and start getting into more complicated stuff. I'd probably drop to a workflow manager um, personally, but so then you can use like BWA and pass all those reads in. So the other thing that I thought was cool in Julia is it seems like the packages plug in better than other ecosystems. Um, and I thought this was a good example from the BedGraph uh, files package that they had. So you can just load it into a data table um, out of the box. It just works because it implements the same interface. Um, you can also load it into an index table as well because it just uses the same interface. And then you can just plot it directly with Gadfly because again, 
the interface of these. And then it also works with qu query down there, as most of them do. Um, most of the BioJulia packages do that are loading these various things. And so you can start using the filter macros, for example, and just save it. And it just kind of all works together nicely. Um, another thing that I that I think is going to be really important in the future is the BioJulia docs. Um, and that's just kind of a effort to join up all of the various docs. That's one thing when I was first getting started with all this was finding the various documentation and then this package calls that package. And then you're like finding this in the lower level package has the examples for the upper level package. And I think some more unity in these is going to be really beneficial for new users and finding these things. Because I think that's one thing that R and Python do get right is just examples. So uh, in bioinformatics, it's very common to use workflow managers. So let's talk about those for a moment and the Julia experience in that. Um, so let's start out with Snakemake. I'd seen this for many years if it had the optionality to run a Julia script and then finally actually used it. Um, so this is just pulling in, a, in a, the IRS data set up there um, with the remote. And then you have your input from that, your output, which is just going to be CSV. And then we're just using the Julia Docker container for this as well. And then this is just a snake make script um, for that. And the interesting part is you can then access this Julia or this snake make object inside of your workflow manager um, on those. So that snake make dot input traces back to this input here. And that would be the IRS data set, for example, on that and loading those up. And then the CSV write on the output you can then just reference in that, that's going to be the out.csv. And so that's really powerful. And then you can start referencing various configs and various params from that as well. Um, so Julia can just kind of plug into Snakemake there and you can start using it. So uh, personally, I use a lot more Nextflow as well. Um, so my friend Alex um, figured this out in like, I think 2019. Um, and started getting into Julia. The issue, and I think I walked in on a conversation earlier on it, of using containers with Julia is then it tries to write to your dot Julia, the like main depot um, path of it. And the problem is that that's not always writable um, in all cases. So what this actually does is this little environment is just how NextFlow like bootstraps onto your various environment variables. And so then that will write to a correct path that you can actually manage on those. Um, so that's just kind of an intro. Like you would probably want to do that in Snakemake as well, but that came from NF Core um, on that part. So uh, what that would look like in Nextflow, on the other hand, uh, we're just using the same container on that. And so in Nextflow, you can also call it as a shebang, like just use the shebang and call that shell function on that. So you can just throw the Julia script into the same process. Um, on those, you would also you also need to install the Julia packages here, but I cut that out for space on the slide. Um, and this is just again loading up the basic CSV file, and then you can reference that using that variable inside the script, um, which looks nice for some of those. Um, but you also can't reference the output in Nextflow, is going to be the the issue. And then on the other hand, you can also just call Julia and call the hello.jl, and then pass the CSV file in that way. Um, and then this is what then your Julia file would look like on the other hand. And then you have your print the line of the program file. And those are just some basics from the running Julia as a script on the documentation. And then you just chmod the, the script and it magically packages it in um, via Nextflow. So let's talk about a quick little analysis on that. Um, this is one that I did a while ago on just overlapping some H3K27 acetylations and some P63 peaks um, to identify these enhancer regions. So basically the cool part of this is just being able to pull in this raw file um, of those and checking for that file. And if not, then we're going to download it from the internet. You could also use data toolkit, et cetera, on those. But this was just kind of a basic example from, uh, I think it was Julia for data analysis at the time. And then you can use genomic features in, and using bed. Um, and then we're just going to read those in using the bed reader as well. And then that pulls into this interesting uh, like type of interval coll collections as well. And that's iterable. And so then you can just simply call each overlap on these. Um, and that is just a function that works with both of those and overlaps them 
Um, and then I just took the first off of it to see what was happening. And then you can just collect all of them and write it to a bed file. So let's see, in conclusion, uh, so where do I feel that Julia is kind of lacking or like where, where some people in bioinformatics might say, well, yeah, I don't really want to use that. So creating binaries and CLIs, um, Python works pretty well for creating CLIs on those. Um, there's some efforts on that. And then like one thing that my lab group asked, so like what about Rust? Like that's what everybody's talking about. And it seems like Rust is going to be better for creating tools like aligners and whatnot, um, variant calling maybe, and then Julia for the actual analysis of those and being able to interopt between various things. And so that's where I kind of see, see the ecosystem going in that sense for those. So a couple of resources up there. There's the bio tutorials, um, which are some tutorial notebooks for bio Julia, and then the new documenter.jl docs as well. Questions? Yes. I just want to say it as the current head of the BioJulia Docs initiative that made my day when you included it. Uh, I have two questions actually. Uh, for the BioJulia Docs, did it come by default in light mode or did you have Slimo selected on your browser? Uh, I think I have it selected on my browser. Okay, so you guys have another issue with not interrupting the dark mode before, so hmm. take care of. Uh, secondly, what are actually the differences between Julia artifacts and the data toolkit package? And the data toolkit package. Yeah, I think it actually uses Julia artifacts under the hood. You'd have to ask Tim about that, but he'd be very happy to talk about that. <laughs> I think that's what it does. Yeah. yeah quick question on: um, Have you um, done uh, ZWAS or genome-wide association studies using Julia? Or I have not. So, because you're showing um, from the green bags, the other ones that uh, we're processing with. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So basically, what that means is that we can tell them to get the good files. So uh, are there uh, packages that can do uh, GWAS with Julia? I do not know. Anyway, I just asked Google it. I think there is a GWAS.jl. I don't know how well it's maintained. Right. Um, it's it's not in Bio Julia, but um, I think I think all of the components are there somewhere. Um, I don't. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, I mean, there's this organization called Open Mendel that I stumbled on recently that has a ton of packages, but their people don't seem to be on Slack or Zulip, so I've never interacted with them. But there's tons of packages in the Open Mendel, and they have an ordinal GWAS package. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And, and, and polygenic risk scores and things like that. Right? Could be. I, I would look in that that repository. I don't, I'm not familiar with hardly any of the packages yeah. in that organization, but there's a bunch of them. I remember being very surprised at how much <laughs> it's like one lap. I don't know. Well, I think what is what CLI stands for? Uh, command line interface. So, uh, you know, OK, that kind of stuff is what you'd be experiencing on those. I think there is an AF4 pipeline for GWAS, though, if you're interested. How far along do you see the engineering to make them like binaries? Because we are very eager I'm not the expert on that. I've heard various, you know, things. Everybody else knows it. I mean, it's, it's not easy, and they're big. So, I mean, you can do it. Um, I would say that if you want to make a binary package that someone's going to call like Bowtie or something, Julia is probably not the best. At the same time. It does sound like there are current efforts for uh, building binaries for Julia. I think the name of Cat is Static Compiler, which is an in concept uh, uh, binary generator. It only supports currently a subset of the Julia language, but we should see over the years a bit more to put into it. Eventually, it could be full support for generating binaries. It was very high up on the wish list that we saw earlier today, so I think that they know that it's a lot of people want this. What was the package? I think it was either static compiler or path compiler, one of those two. Other questions? Yeah. How do you feel like the 
will the environmental community shift towards Julius? Do you think there's like an actual flow from other packages or other programming languages into Julia right now? Or do you think it's like still fairly like mm. not really? I think that's kind of why I wanted to give the talk was I kind of wanted to answer the questions for myself of like, you know, the various package ecosystems and you're like, oh, well, there's all these packages in R and Python and they've already kind of like one in that sense. And so I hope that there's a flow of people moving into it in that sense and kind of proving that you can just do the analysis in that and then do it in a simpler way. Do we have... So, like R, yeah, and uh, it does not have the shitty package control that uh, Python has. Yeah. yeah. So Python, I I lost my hair just because of Python. Yeah. So I'm trying to to merge things like what I'm doing. But why why would you call? Would we want to call from Julia Python because mm -hmm. you have to deal with the same problems again. But so the the packages that and that matches I'm doing that I'm mean, it's a nightmare. I can tell you've been hurt too. <laughs> So, like two slightly divergent questions. So the first is, um, when are we going to make a workflow orchestrator in Julia? It's been on my wish list for ages, and I keep thinking I'm going to build it, and it just doesn't seem worth the development time. But I really want it. And the second thing is, this is sort of getting weird too. Do you think that we need to get Julia into Conda somehow, so that we can go in that direction to get more of the people who are used to using managing Conda environments access to Julia tools? Hmm. Okay, let's answer the Conda and Julia. I thought there was already a Conda package for Julia's, right? Yeah, so you can install it in that way, but then you have to like, yeah, I, I don't like the whole like R sticking all the packages in Conda just sounds. Like, why would you yeah. want to do that? <laughs> or like, I feel like that's just gonna be more pain than right. yeah. worth of like, just explaining them like, no, 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 just install with PKG. Uh, Workflow Manager, there actually is someone who wrote one. They also wrote a job scheduler in Julia as well, but I don't know if it hooks into like multiple computers or, or whatnot. They gave a talk on it yesterday online. Uh, I think it's called pipelines.jl. So that looked interesting, I don't know. Like, yeah, syntactically getting these workflow managers right, I feel is really hard. That's where you kind of converged onto. Yeah. And what about the managers like the DDC or Airflow or like more standard that are using the industry? Have you <laughs> that's always a that's always a great question. I think the issue with those is they expect a singular environment, is what I've I've seen, is like they expect you to like use Python all the way down. And it's like okay, I'm gonna use like Python for like a snippet of this and the rest is gonna be plugging in command line tools. We also, Bioinformatics also works in like a file format very typically, whereas those would work maybe in memory a lot and just passing around data frames. So that's kind of the issue with those. So yeah, you can use that if you wanted to. I feel like you're gonna end up causing yourself more pain versus a workflow manager that like expects it. And another advantage I think is that uh, in, in much of the uh, bioinformatics uh, workflows, we tend to use set and mock for pattern matching and regular expressions. So using Julia might be a little bit uh, more advantageous in status, but pretty mature already that Yeah. But also, again, you can just call, uh, like, you don't have to get rid of those crazy pattern matches that you already have. You can just call Hawk and said from Julia or from those various workflow managers you know, that I was mentioning. Is typically what we want. Do we have a last question? What time for last quick question? I can have another one if nobody yes. else has it. Yeah. No. Uh, out of all the, those, uh, so the only thing that I, that, that I think I'm still using R for is to plot, to use ggplot to like a more expanded platform. I know that I used it a while ago at the time, but it was a downgrade, let's say, in ggplot to add the others to. Approaching like the functional for like plots and makey. Uh, I still like I was trying to do a custom plot a while ago of like basically it's set, like for that um, for the head and neck squamous cell and like plotting each of these samples comparatively um, based on a couple genes. And so exactly, you're like constantly like searching and, and really trying to hunt for it, whereas then sometimes those plots are just there. And you know, that's okay. Like you can just run ggplot2 from it. Yeah. Um, Let's all thank Edmund one more time.